And those of you that aren't local, we had a heck of a winter and it's like 80 degrees right now and people in Minnesota are choosing to spend their lunch hour with me. So I appreciate it. Um, I hope to make your time worthwhile. And those of you that are not in Minnesota, um, it's a beautiful day. And so I hope you come here and join us in this beautiful weather eventually. Uh, okay, welcome everybody. My name is Maggie Thomas and I lead the uh, Business Career Center here at Carlson. Uh, we work with um, all of our graduate students and all of our employers that hire undergrad and graduate students. And I'm going to be talking about personal branding today, which is a series in our career fundamentals series that my colleague, Will O'Brien, who is going to be sort of producing the event today, um, leads. And so we try to talk about really standard or um, relevant, standard or relevant and timely career topics for all of you. We record the sessions, so if you have to step away, you will have access to the recording. Um, and today, we're talking about personal branding. And when Will approached me to talk about personal branding, I got pretty excited. I actually love this topic because when personal branding is done well, it forces you to be really introspective. And helping people be introspective is the entire reason I got into career services. Um, so I'm excited to share some of that with you today. A tiny bit about me is that I have been in career services for over two decades. So I've seen a lot and I've seen lots of shifts in the way um, we educate and train students. I love where these shifts are going and I'm excited to share um, how we talk about personal branding today um, with all of you. Uh, a few reminders for housekeeping. Um, I hope that this can be as interactive as possible, although we are recording it. So we aren't doing breakout rooms or anything like that. Um, we do have the chat feature, which I love to use. So there's a couple of times where I'll ask you to write things into the chat. Um, if you have any questions, you can either A, write them in the chat and Will or myself will see them and try to address them. I'm fine with being stopped for, for a question. Or you can also raise your hand. You can use um, one of the one of the icons to raise your hand, and I will try to notice it, or Will will try to notice it and call on you. All right, let's go ahead and get started and talk about personal branding. And I'm gonna try to move a slide. There we go. Um, okay, our agenda today. First, I'm gonna talk to you about why is self-branding or personal branding so important? Why do I even need to care about it? What is it? Um, next, we're gonna talk about how you can actually know yourself um, to create a strong brand. Then we're gonna talk about how do you communicate yourself? Um, how do you communicate that both um, verbally and online? Um, and then how do you constantly reevaluate that to make sure that um, your brand is relevant and true to who you are today? So we're gonna we're gonna talk about why branding is important. I'm gonna give you the tools um, to create an effective uh, personal brand, and then I'm gonna give you steps on how you can figure out what your brand is. Before I go too much into this, I'm leaving up here. This is our DEI statement for the Carlson Business Career Center. And a really important sentence in this that I think definitely applies to what we're going to talk about with personal branding is that we encourage students, this is the second or third sentence, we encourage students to remain authentic while they learn about various career paths and emerge as leaders within organizations. And so that authenticity piece is going to come through again and again and again and again through this presentation, please remember it. Um, I want to drive this home now for any of you that are current students or any of you that are prospective students. All right, what is a brand? A definition and why is it important? The definition of a brand is essentially, it's your unique combinations of skills, of personality, of traits, of interests, and really how you express them in the world. It's how people see and experience you. That is your personal brand. You have one, whether you've created one or not, because people are experiencing you all the time. So it's really a good idea, particularly if you're launching into your professional career or you're trying to make a job transition, to take some time to reflect on how do people experience me and is that congruent on how they want, how I would like them to experience me. This next slide shows some of the world's most powerful or popular brands. I've got icons up there. I would like you in the chat to um, tell me what comes to mind when you see these logos. Logos. It could be anyone or it could be all of them, but what comes to mind? Innovation. Thank you, Ankit. Anyone else? What comes to mind? Customer focus, minimalist, big business, highly regarded. Leaders. 
Google Smart, Walmart Savings. Yes, massive scale. They're definitely large companies, right? Trendsetters. American Dream. Great. Did any of you have a difficult time identifying what these brands were? Some of them don't even have the name. Everybody knows them. Thank you, Teresa. Yes, everybody knows who they are. Um, are they all the same? Do they all stand for the same thing? Walmart, we someone wrote in here. They're, they're all very, very different. Walmart, someone wrote in there, inexpensive. Would you ever use um, inexpensive to describe Apple? No, no. I think the price of a, an iPhone now is like $1,300. No, no one would ever describe that as inexpensive. Um, and so often when we're working with business students, they think they have to use the same adjectives to describe themselves. But a really good brand is relevant to who they are. They have figured out who are they, who is their market and who are they pitching themselves to? And it's unique, right? It's relevant to their audience and it's unique. Keep that in mind as we continue. Okay, so really powerful brands are relevant and they fulfill a need. They don't fulfill every need, they fulfill a need. They don't try to be everything to everyone. Um, for, for, for those of you that are in the US right now, two competitor big box stores are Walmart and Target. They, they don't describe themselves the same. You don't feel the same when you go into their stores and they both do really, really well because they both know who they are. Um, they're consistent. You know what you're going to get. You know what you're going to get when you're working with a really powerful brand. They are emotional or they, they, they engage an emotion in you. You feel connected to them in some way. Um, and they engage people as human beings. And they also tell a story or a narrative that is fairly consistent. Branding can also do this for people. So again, I want you to get your chats ready. When I say the word Oprah, or you think of the image of Oprah, what comes to mind? Write it in the chat. Inspiration, righteous, confident, kind and helpful, story, courage. You get a car, motivational, bold, books, I think of books, beautiful. Self-made, media guru, yep. Often the adjectives that come to describe her um, is trusting, bold, smart, philanthropic, um, a listener, right? These are the words that come to describe her. She is incredibly intentional and has thought through those words that A, that is who she is, and B, every time she puts herself out in the world, it is consistently that. You always know, and for decades, for decades, I remember watching Oprah in the 80s. For decades, that's who she's been. She's been consistently that. And she might shift, her interests might shift, sure. And she lets you know that her interests are shifting, but she didn't become a new person, right? So she's constantly reevaluating that and, and pretty consistent with that brand. And it's true to who she is. When you think about your personal brand, you wanna make sure that it's clear and it conjures a really clear image. It's consistent. You want to make sure that it tells a narrative, a story that's true to your own personal story. It's not anybody else's story. And that additionally, that it, um, it brings up some sort of emotion. People can connect to it in some way. And it's not going to be connected in the same way it is for everybody. But they, people connect to it, to it in some way. Another thing I want to talk about your personal brand that I think we often forget about. We often focus on how our internal brand helps connect us to people and then they can want us, right? Or they can engage with us. Your personal brand is also a really important tool for you internally because it can serve as your compass and your guide. Once you know who you are and what you want and what your adjectives are and what your brand is, it can help you navigate, do I want that position? Do I want to join this board? Do I want to do my free time? Do I want to take my free time? with this. What do I want to say yes to? What do I want to say no to? It serves as your own compass. So it's not just about for everybody else and how they can connect with you. It's really how you can navigate your own life and it can be your own internal compass. So I think that that piece is even more important than the other. And I think it's a good reminder on why why we constantly want to want to be assessing that. 
And so a really good way to figure out how do I have a great strong internal compass so that other so that I know who I am and what I should do and others should know who I am is really to, to know yourself really, really well. Here's a quote from Brene Brown. I'm sure a lot of you know who she is, but she's a writer and an author, and she talks about um, basically human potential and human growth and, and emotions. And um, she says, authenticity is the daily practice of letting go who we think we are supposed to be and embracing who we are. And I'm going to hit home on that quite a bit through this presentation. Um, I know that some of you are prospective students, and I know that some of you are current students. And in business school, we often see students, as um, one of our colleagues likes to say, shooting all over themselves. Um, there is a um, idea, and this is going away a lot, and I like that. But there, in the past, there was this idea of what it meant to be a business person and how you should show up. And so students, when they enter B-School, they often think, oh my gosh, I've got to mold myself into this package that fits into this idea of what a business school a business student is or a professional is. Um, and really, that's not authentic. And that's not going to serve as your compass. And that's not going to help other people connect to you. So how do you get authentic? All right, I'm going to take what seems like a really big tangent here, but I want you to bear with me. So one of the keys to getting um, authentic, authentic is to get rooted and grounded. Um, I do a lot of yoga. I don't know if any of you do yoga. If you do, great. If you don't, bear with me. I promise I'm not going to have you do a bunch of yoga poses right now. But one of the one of the things that happens when you're in a yoga class and you're in a pose um, is an instructor will often remind you to root to rise. And what that means is get grounded before you can fully get into this position the way it's supposed to be. And every time a yoga instructor says the simple phrase of root to rise, you your body makes tiny adjustments and you feel that pose more fully, you can embrace it more fully and you almost can do a deep sigh of relief because it's like where you're supposed to be. And that is such to me a good metaphor into life when we're thinking about our career journey and our job search and particularly when we're creating our um, personal brand. So when you think of the definition of root, one of the key words in that definition to me is really getting entrenched in the present moment. And as I work with students and I work with alumni and I, as I, I am a human being myself, I recognize that so much of my time is spent forward thinking or reflecting on what went wrong in the past, right? I will catch myself sometimes walking across the skyway to a meeting and barely even remembering that walk and anything I noticed because my mind is on everything else I need to do, right? or what I said wrong in the past meeting, or that email I didn't finish, but it's certainly not in the present moment. And if you're not in the present moment, how are you going to know how you're experiencing the present moment, how you're showing up in the present moment, and what you even like about the present moment? And part of understanding your brand is to really understand how you experience life, how you thrive, and what you like. And if we spend so much time not in that present moment, we're not gonna have any tools to understand what our brand is what job we should be searching for, how we should be describing ourselves. So one of the key ways, a key tip to sort of get into the present moment is to engage your parasympathetic system. Your parasympathetic system is the system that helps you relax. It helps you get into the present. It lowers your heart rate. It is the opposite of your sympathetic system, which is really a life-saving system. It's great when you're running from a bear. Your sympathetic system is the thing that you see danger, your heart rate beats faster, you become laser focused, your pupils dilate because you're basically looking for danger, right? You're looking for danger and you're breathing really fast and you're thinking about what could hurt you. Um, the problem is um, in our day-to-day -day life, we spend so much time in our sympathetic system because we're going from activity to activity to activity. We see one stressful thing and we jump to that and we don't necessarily engage our parasympathetic system to help us get present. So two quick tips to engage your parasympathetic, parasympathetic system is one to really think about breathing. As you're switching from activity to activity, if you're leaving a meeting or you're on the car ride home to take a kid to an event or you're finishing up an email that may, maybe made you a little bit mad and now you've got to jump into another meeting, engage your breath. There's lots of different ways to do that. A really simple one is called box breathing where you inhale for four, hold for four, exhale for four, 
and hold for four. Lots of different ways to breathe, but I really encourage you to try to infuse that into your day. So you again can get present. So you have data about what your personal brand is. And another, another quick thing to do is you can um, do a forward fold. So I, I lied, there is a little bit of yoga in this. You can really just lower your heart and do a forward fold. Sometimes when I've just seen a stressful email, I will shut my door. I will do a forward fold for 20 seconds and I will come up and I will walk to my next thing because it lowered my heart rate and it engaged me into the present moment. Just really, really important to think about when you're thinking about how do I, how well can I get to know myself and how can I get present in, in my situations now? So I have data to know who I am and who I want to be. And knowing yourself um, and really getting rooted in, in the present moment is really, really important as a job search tool too. Because when we look at, oops, the skills that um, employers most want, um, interpersonal skills comes at the top of the game. And people that know themselves really well and are pretty rooted in who they are often tend to connect with other people quite well too. Um, so this data and this graph came from GMAX recruiter survey. So every year, Graduate Management Admissions Council asks us for our top recruiters, and they ask a bunch of other schools for their top recruiters, and they survey the recruiters and they ask a bunch of questions. Questions around how many you're going to hire, what are the typical salary ranges, and what are skills that are important to you? I've been doing this for over 10 years at Carlson. Every single time, interpersonal skills is up at the top. And you don't have strong interpersonal skills if you also aren't quite grounded in who you are. All right, so how do you think about, and so now, now I've hopefully convinced you why a brand is important, why you really need to take the time to know yourself when you're thinking about your brand. How do you go about assessing what your own personal brand is, right? Okay, Maggie, I got it. I need to get present. Um, branding is important. How do I figure out what my brand is now that I figured out how to get into the the present moment. So there's a couple of key ways to do that. One of them is to keep track of career highlights and peak moments. Um, I don't think anyone, I don't shouldn't say anyone, I don't think most of us do this very well. What we do is we do a really good job of catalog cataloging all of the times we didn't succeed or we messed up. Um, we do not do a great job of catalog cataloging our peak moments and the things that we did well. Um, I will often advise people at the very least once a week, set aside 15 minutes on a Friday, put it as your regular calendar thing. What went well this week? What did I do really well? What made me feel good or where I felt in flow, where I lost track of time because I really enjoyed that. If you don't intentionally write it down, you will not remember. You will remember instead all the mistakes you made or any time you felt slighted or anything like that because that's what our brain does particularly for sympathetic systems and overdrive. Um, I have a journal that's called the Panda Planner. Um, I, I, I don't make any money from this, but it's a great planner. And um, each day it asks me to start the day with what am I looking forward to? Um, and then it prioritizes things and I have a to-do list. But at the end of each day, it asks me three things that went well and one thing I'm going to improve. And so every night I bring it upstairs before I do my nightly reading, I usually read before I go to bed, I will write down three things that went well and one thing that I will improve upon. And for me, it's really important because almost, I mean, I would say 80 to 90% of the time, the things that went well are in relation to people and communicating and engaging. And the things I want to improve on is related to people, something that didn't go well with a person. And what that tells me is that my brand is really people-oriented. I do best when I'm engaging with people and connecting. I'm a connector. And I can see that when I'm tracking my peak moments, right? My my, my highlights are rarely around data. You know, they're, they're, they're rarely around that. Those types of things are really around people. And so that teaches me something about myself. Another piece of data when you're thinking about your brand is you, looking at performance data. So performance reviews or annual metrics, what, what do you do well? What are things that, um, that, that, you, that you do well that you might not have noticed, particularly if we haven't been that present? What have other people noticed that you've done well? Look at those and track those. Um, I remember several years ago, a comment on one of my performance reviews was that um, I do a good job of identifying data people should know. I had no idea I was good at that. I, I am? 
oh, great. Maybe I should infuse more of that, right? I had no idea, right? Because I, I probably was spending too much time in my sympathetic system, but that was a good piece for me to know um, about myself. Um, and I like it. I probably wouldn't tell people that if I didn't like it, because sometimes people will comment on things you do well, and it's like, that's great, but I don't really like that. That doesn't need to be part of your brand. Um, assessments are also really good tools. Um, here's a few that are standard that people know. One of these that's listed strength finder we offer in our office. Another one we offer that's not listed as career leader. Um, but these types of assessments um, also give you language, which I think is helpful in personal branding. They'll give you language towards um, ways you can phrase things that you might be good at. Um, and reflect, reflection and self-observation. Really just always always do a gut check. Do I like what I'm doing? Does this fit into my value system? Um, gathering feedback from others, which we're going to do in a, man, in, in a minute. And then also, I think it's really important to, um, you don't work in a vacuum, right? You can know yourself really, really well, but it's also important to know how you operate in a community particularly in your work community. What type of communities work best for you? What type of organizations work best for you? So on this next slide, um, I have a list of different types of cultures. And we do have a recording of a presentation in, a pa in the past, if you're really interested in culture. And there's a whole presentation we've done on that. And this slide was taken from that. But I think it's important to highlight some of the different types of standard cultures that are out there. Um, and reading through some of them, so you can think about what cultures do I thrive in? Because no matter how solid your brand is, if you plant that awesome brand that you know who you are into a place that you cannot thrive, it will be very hard to be satisfied. Um, and so, and also you want to know where you fit in best. So again, it can serve as that compass and guide. So I've listed these and then there's there's company logos next to them. Uh, a couple to just call out that are common ones that we see. Adhocracy is an innovative take risk type of culture. Um, they adapt really, really quickly. Um, and it's very, very focused on individual initiative. Like you need to take the, you need to identify what you need to do and run with it. So a lot of tech startups fit into this space. Um, that's different than maybe a clan culture that functions more like a family. Um, there's a little less hier hierarchy and there's informal communication, but everything sort of needs to be made on a consensus because they're operating as a family. So it's very much belonging. Um, compare both of those with the hierarchy culture. So think banking. This is very traditional, highly structured. People know when they will move up what they need to do, who moves up. You do not make a move without talking to your boss, right? Like it's very, very structured, but you have a lot of information on what you need to do to succeed. People will tell you, right? Comparing that to ad hocracy, where you figure out, you be innovative and figure out what you need to do to succeed. Someone who really, really likes structure and likes knowing what needs to be done to get to that next step probably wouldn't thrive in an ad hocracy culture. So when they're thinking of their brand and they're describing themselves to someone, they probably want to include that they like structure, right? Because that is important to them thriving and them being that best version of themselves. All right, now you get to take out your phones. Um, and what I'm going to ask you to do is to quickly think of three people who know you pretty well, maybe from different settings. Maybe there's a work colleague, maybe there's a personal friend, maybe it's a family member. Um, three people, you can send it to five like this says, but we've probably got time for three. Um, and I want you to say, quick, I'm in a workshop right now. What are three adjectives that best describe me? Thank you. All right, now, as those come rolling in, um, go ahead and just set your phone aside. Um, this will be information for you from the future. Um, and that goes back to, to this slide a few slides ago that talked about um, how, what are the pieces of your brand and how do you assess it? Number five, getting feedback from others is one piece just like a performance review is one piece. It's not the only piece. And again, these adjectives that come back 
you get to decide which one of those you want as part of your brand, right? You could decide, you get to pick and choose where you put them, but it's good information because sometimes others can see things about yourself that you don't always see. Again, particularly if you've been operating in sympathetic system overdrive, which many of us have. I think it's also important to talk about how you need to be strategic with your brand. Um, you will use it differently in different situations, um, but you wanna really be thoughtful about how you share your brand and what you do highlight. So you wanna highlight three to four strengths. You wanna think about what do I, what am I known for and what do I want to be known for? Um, notice how I'm writing what you are known for and what you wanna be known for. What, the, what you are is before what you want. A lot of times I have seen students and alumni approach personal branding from the end goal. Okay, so I know I want to be a marketer at a tech company, and this is what they want, so I'm going to make my brand that. And that is the wrong approach, because that, again, is going back to shitting all over yourself and fitting yourself into this box of what that end goal is. And I'm encouraging all of you to start with what am I, figure that out, and then go and see what's out there and where could you thrive. And if it still ends up being a marketer at a tech company, great then you will talk about yourself authentically. You will highlight the things about yourself that A, are really important to you, and B, the tech company will love, but they will be things that are about yourself, not just things you think that they want. Um, additionally, you wanna make sure that your brand is unique and that it's including differentiators and that it exudes a vibe of who you are. And so I have a story a little bit about those last two. So this is a, a few years, a few years ago, I was working with an MBA student um, in our full-time program. And he had strong experience. He had four years of experience at a large known um, company. He was an international student, a large known company back in India. Um, and he was a supply chain expert. He'd had a really great career in four, four years, really moved up in supply chain. Um, and he wanted to continue. He really, really wanted to make sure he got a job in the U.S. He wanted to continue in supply chain and he wanted to do it in a tech company. And the other thing you should know about him is that he is one of the most personal student, personable students I have ever known. Um, and I've been doing this for a really long time. He was really, really engaging, really, really funny, became best friends with everyone, no matter where they were from, right away, was really, really fun. And when you were with him, you just felt super connected and engaged. He was one of those people that could just light up a room. And um, he started networking and he came to me a couple months into his networking of his first year. And he said, it's not going well. Like each conversation feels like really stale. The conversation feels a little bit stifted, stifled. And I don't get referrals to network with someone else. And so I'm like, well, why don't we, why don't you practice your pitch or your positioning statement, which we'll talk about in a minute with me. And his positioning statement included all of his awesome supply chain experience in a really structured, formulaic way, and that was it. And I said, why don't you start infusing some of your strong communication skills? You're already a leader in the student body. You've started a couple of new clubs. Why don't you infuse some of that in your brand? Because that is your differentiator. You're a supply chain expert that also happens to be an amazing communicator. Um, but he wasn't using his differentiator in it because he was so focused on what he thought the company wanted instead of what he was. And what he was and that thing that made him unique is would have been more appealing and people would have connected to that. People connect when you really highlight what's unique, but also when you highlight what is, they'll connect to that a little bit more. Okay, so let's think about how, now I've given you tools on how do you start to think about what your brand is? What are the elements that you should be gathering? What are the pieces of data you should be gathering when you're building your brand? Um, now let's think about how do you communicate that? <clears throat> this quote I put up here, this came last year from an executive recruiter panel that we hosted. It was one of the top Twin Cities executive recruiter. She's a partner at a recruiting firm here. And she was telling the students, don't make other people work too hard to figure out who you are. So again, you've taken the time to figure out who you are. Now let's make sure you're communicating that appropriately because if you don't clearly and succinctly communicate that, whether it's online, which we'll talk about in a bit, or whether it's verbally, you make people work too hard. Like, I don't know what this person wants or what they're about. So I actually can't refer them to someone because I'm, my brain is having to work too hard on how to help them. So make it really clear so people can easily help you. 
<clears throat> so the first step kind of tool when you're thinking about communicating, we usually ask students to start at square one and that start to craft your positioning statement or your pitch. This is a statement that can be anywhere, honestly, from like 15 seconds, if you're just walking up to someone in a networking meeting, all the way to a minute and a half if it's in an interview. But it's a, it's a professional introduction that really communicates who you are, your specialty, what experiences that you have that's relevant, what you offer that's relevant, and what, how you do that uniquely. These are the elements that are included in a positioning statement. And this again, this can be used at any professional event, when you're walking up to people, when you're meeting recruiters, when you're at a conference, um, if you're talking to clients, if you're in more of a sales role, um, this, is, this is the type of, of, of statement you would use you would use then. And again, we have you craft this because some form of this will be used in various different ways, whether it's online or in interviews or networking. This right here is the structure of how we think about it. So this gives you kind of a visual <clears throat> and it's a starting off place. In no means every time you introduce yourself, are you going to introduce all of it, all of this, but this gives you sort of a structure on what to work from. So a positioning statement will include who you are. So that could be your current title or team. It could be your status as a student and a title that you have if you're if you're one of our working professional students. It could be just your, st your student status. Um, if you're a prospective student, it could be your title and future MBA, part-time MBA, whatever that is. Um, what you do. So what are key work experiences that you've had? Any current projects that are relevant right now? Um, and then how you do it. How do you do this in a way that's true to you, that might not be the same as everybody else? And is there a way or a manner that you do it? Every positioning and statement is not going to include all of these things every time. You know, a good, a good tell me about yourself um, answer in an interview might include all of this. But if you're walking up to someone in a networking at, at a conference, you're probably not going to have a 45 second introduction that could get a little awkward. But framing this out helps you sort of think about what are the things that I do like to highlight in the right opportunity. And you will have these slides too. Um, again, the video, um, we record this and we'll also send the slides out so you can get a version of this. Um, so you don't have to furiously write it down. We'll make sure that you get some sort of version of this. Here's a sample statement, sample, one version of it. Forgive me, I'll read it. I'll try to read slow. You probably already realized I don't talk that slow, but I'll try to read this slowly. I'm a sales and marketing professional with five years of experience in the CPG, consumer packaged goods industry, where I've been involved in all stages of the product marketing life cycle. My expertise is in conceptualizing, developing, and or launching new products. Now at Lando Lakes, I recently worked with a team that launched a new dairy product that achieved double digit sales growth in its first two years on the market in the US. I tend to thrive in environments where I can innovate quickly and work with a wide variety of people and functions. So this person spent a lot of time talking about their current work experience. I would gather that this person wants more experiences like that. Otherwise she wouldn't have told me about this, right? So I would gather that. If you are looking to make a transition, you're probably not going to talk a ton about your experiences. Maybe you'll talk about the way you do things a little bit more than the actual concrete experiences you've had if you're looking to do something else, right? So you, you can see how you can shift and mold the statement depending on your situation. Other things that you can include. There's a lot of things here. In no way are you going to include all of these things because that would be a really long monologue. Um, and people would stop listening no matter how interesting you were. But you can pick and choose some of these things. If um, values right now are really important to you, when my children were really, really young, having flexibility and working in a place where I could talk about being a mom and was really, really important. It still is, but it's particularly in those early days. That value piece was never not in my brand. Being a mom was never not in my brand at that point, right? Because that was so key to who I am. Um, I've talked to other people where really moving up the ladder, so sort of like prestige, is really important to them. They want to grow. They have big dreams and big goals. So that motivator piece is what they're going to talk about a little bit more. Um, if you really are a person that leads with your strengths and focuses on that, which is a, which we advise, you're going to spend a little bit more time on your strengths. Um, and again, you're also going to think about what are my differentiators too, right? So if um, 
I am working in um, IT and I am an amazing communicator. You're going to want to talk about that a lot, right? Because not only are you really great technically, but so is everybody else in IT. But you communicate really, really effectively. You're going to want that's going. You're going to want that to be part of your brand. So that's when that end goal does dictate a little bit more what you say. It doesn't change what's true about you. It's just what you highlight in that moment. Hopefully that makes sense. What to watch out for? Um, a positioning statement or a pitch that is too broad or too narrow. Again, if anyone can say this about themselves, too broad. If you're going for an IT role and you talk about your strong technical skills, awesome. Every single other person is saying that. That's pretty broad. Or, um, yeah, I'll leave that. That's a good enough example. Or is it too narrow? I see people often including like tools that are so specific to their company that they're an expert in this tool. And it's like, that's awesome. Nobody even knows what that tool is. That's so, so, so narrow. Um, if it's irrelevant, if you're highlighting skills that aren't even important in that role, that's not something that you want to talk about. And if using those skills are really important to you, again, that's that compass piece. Maybe you shouldn't be applying to this role, right? Um, and that's how it can serve as your compass. And then finally, jargon, filling it with a lot of fluff words. Maybe you've heard people use these business words before. Um, you don't want to fill um, any positioning statement with too many of those fluff words, which really take the meaning and make you less of a real person to somebody. All right. Let's talk quickly about online communication. I'm there's a lot of ways that your brand is built online. We talk to students about this a lot, particularly some undergrad students. However, the one I'm going to focus on is LinkedIn because that is the tool that is meant for um, personal branding and professional branding. Um, so we're gonna, I'm just gonna give you some quick tips from a branding perspective. We have experts, Will is one of them, on how to utilize LinkedIn as a search tool and how to use it in your favor. I'm not touching any of that. I'm simply talking about broad best practices as a branding tool um, because it is building your brand while you're sleeping. Even if you haven't spent time on LinkedIn, it is building your brand. Particularly if you start networking and you haven't put thought into what is out there, it's doing its branding for you. So you want to think about it and want to be intentional about it. So I'm just going to talk about a few areas of LinkedIn, like I mentioned. The first is your profile picture. Um, you want to make sure that first and foremost, it looks like you. If you never wear suits and you don't want to work in a place where you wear a suit, do not wear a suit. Um, if you never smile, if you're more serious, then don't smile. Um, and make sure that your pose looks natural, not too stiff. Oftentimes, if you get professional photographers that want to pose you in a certain way, use your voice to speak up and say, I never stand like that. That doesn't feel like me. You want to be as natural as possible. Number two please make sure it's only you in the photo. I know you might've looked amazing at that wedding with your partner or your friend. Um, and it was a really great hair day, but you cannot use that picture and crop the other person out. They will be able to tell it does not look professional. You want it to just be you and intentional. Um, and you can, do, you can do great LinkedIn photos with your selfie, with your camera. Like you don't have to hire a photographer. Um, at Carlson, we do try to create some opportunities, particularly in the fall when there's new students here, that you do have a chance to get your photo done by a professional photographer. But if right now you have that wedding photo up and you're like, oh, crumb, what do I do, Maggie? Um, there are tips to taking your own personal um, selfie. You can set it up with a timer and do it well. Um, make sure you have the right expression. Um, and I, I just touched on that, but you want your picture to match your brand. So um, I smile a lot. I probably wouldn't have a serious a serious face in um, in my LinkedIn because um, that's just not how I am. But I've seen other people that if they smile, that doesn't look like them either. You want it to feel really authentic to you. Um, you want it to be purposeful. I see that I have a uh, uh, missing L, so I apologize, or the L went somewhere. So sorry about that. Um, but that's not purpose foo, it's purposeful. Um, and just make sure that this was clearly taken to be a professional photo. And when I say selfie, if, if you have to do that workaround, it's not the selfie where you're holding it up and looking at it. It's where you're setting up your camera, you're putting the timer on and you're posing. So it looks purposeful. And then a really tactical best practice is that your face should take up about 60% of the frame. 
So you don't want to be really, really far away. You also don't want to be too close. And again, if you do have a professional photographer take this, they will understand that people are getting really good. Um, in fact, really good at LinkedIn photos. In fact, usually when you get a professional photo done, um, there will be one that's just for LinkedIn. They'll tell you this is your LinkedIn because it's it's meant to fit into that into that square. Okay. Moving on from pictures, and I start with pictures, you guys, because it's important. And I wish that the picture wasn't the first thing that they saw and the content was, but right now that's not the world we live in. And the first thing they do see is the picture. And so it's a branding opportunity and you want to make sure that it feels true to you. Um, does your headline communicate your brand? So the headline is that title that's under that, that that's under your picture next to your picture. So here is an example of three different titles. First one is product manager at 3M. The next one is tech industry leader, product manager, consumer behavior enthusiast, woman in tech advocate. And the final one is product management and marketing leader in SaaS and software IT agile and analytics. Um, in the chat, I would love to hear from you why you think this all, all the same person, right? All the same person. Why would you use a these titles differently depending? Like in what situation would you use the last one, for example? Anyone has an idea right in the chat? So that's that product manager and marketing leader looking for work, last one interview recruiter, specifically looking for agile experience. Exactly. This person to me, it's probably searching, right? They're looking for new opportunities. What about the first one? Product manager at 3M. When would you use that one? Just, just having your, yeah, it's branding for you, right? Current role, you're, you're probably pretty happy. You're not ready to move. You're not actively looking. You're proud that you're a product manager at 3M. Potentially, maybe you want to grow within 3M, right? Maybe, maybe you want to move around in 3M. Um, and then the middle one could be a variety of reasons, but go ahead and write in the chat. I'm curious what you all think of that middle one. When would you use that one? Leadership role, LinkedIn profile, networking, LinkedIn header, um, target audience for, for LinkedIn. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. I definitely think they're looking for leadership opportunities. They're clearly passionate about certain aspects of technology, and they probably would like to connect to other people connected to that too. Being a thought leader, absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, good one, Will. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, all these all these are reasons. Um, but you can see they're all the same person. So you get to really pick and choose. And this will change. What you write early on in your program or early on in a certain position will not be probably the same as what you write later because you're using LinkedIn for something different. And there's a lot being said just in that headline. And the headline in the picture, the first thing people see. So you want to put some thought into it. Um, okay. Next, let's look at the about summary section. Okay, couple best practices. One, make sure it's complete. Do not miss the opportunity to actually write something here. It's pretty, it's there, there's space for reasons. So make sure you write something. Is it authentic to you or could anyone have written it? This is where I see a lot of students doing that whole, I want this end role, so I'm gonna describe a person that fits into that end role. And that can sound like anybody. It doesn't sound like you. And there's so many interesting things to you. So many times I'm talking to a student, it's like, why, the way you just said it to me, just put that in your LinkedIn summary. That sounded great. That is who you are, put that there. Does it highlight your skills and accomplishments? And also does it include keywords? And oftentimes what we see is, um, and I'm gonna read a sample one for you. You're gonna have to bear with me reading something else. Um, it's not this one, because I wouldn't expect you to read that, very small. Um, but oftentimes what people, if the keywords don't naturally fit into that summary as you're speaking in your own voice, people will just have a skills colon or keywords colon and then list a bunch of them so that the AI, um, the recruiter AI material can pick that up. So you can do that. That's totally fine and standard. Okay. I am going to read a couple paragraphs of a sample about section. Um, 
And we only have a few slides left, so bear with me, and then we'll leave it up for questions. But this is how authentic and true you can be and how much variety there is. The human brain is a crazy place, and there are two things that fascinate, fascinate me most about product and growth marketing. First, the concept of consumer logic and how rational yet irrational it can be. And second, the challenge of communicating in a way that persuades and convinces consumers always requires optimization. So you're optimizing for something that's both rational and irrational. I apply the same thinking to product marketing that I also apply to leadership, because whether you're connecting with consumers or with your team, you're connecting with the fun irrationality of their logic in order to bring ideas together, influence an outcome, and optimize and scale for future growth. Outside of work, I serve on the board of directors for San Francisco Women in Tech, an organization committed to improving the network and success of women in technology in Silicon Valley. I coach Running for Girls on the Run, an organization designed to inspire young girls to be healthy, confident, and joyful, and I'm an avid runner, cyclist, and painter. I also consider myself a flavor ambassador of the Humphrey Slocum ice cream and can sometimes be spotted scooping on warm summer nights. It's a lot, but I fully know who this person is. I know that she understands marketing really, really well and is super interested in consumer. I understand that she leads people in a really interesting way and has a theory and an opinion on it. And I understand that she's a full human being with many interests that now I want to talk to her about ice cream completely. I want to see her paintings. And I also understand that she's passionate about women leadership. I know a lot about her. And that's the thing she wants me to know about her. She's not trying to be everything to everyone. She's trying to be who she is and have people that like who she is connect with her. She's clearly a little bit more seasoned in her work, but you can see how there's a lot of space for you to be you. All right, moving on. Next section quickly is the experience section. Um, just make sure you curate, think in terms of career highlights. This is not, you don't need to write your entire resume in the experience section. Um, curate and think of some highlights. Um, demonstrate effectiveness, similar to a resume though, you wanna be listing some res re results. Um, you want to make sure that when possible, those bullets can contain keywords that are industry specific. Um, and then you want to make sure that it piques readers' interest, that they maybe want to learn a little bit more. LinkedIn has lots of other branding opportunities. This is just a snapshot of some of them. Um, I think people often ask how many recommendations should I get or endorsements. I think a few recommendations from differing places like a supervisor, a peer, someone you maybe collaborated with that um, in another unit or another function, those are nice um, recommendations to have because they show different sides of you and how you fully are as an evolved worker. Um, also, groups are a really important tool, um, particularly alumni groups. We're always going to suggest a Carlson student join that group. You're going to have access and it's got access to other alumni um, and it's going to make networking a little bit easier. I'm not going to dig into too much of that because a lot of that gets into the search stuff, which we have some great presentations on that already. Um, okay, so next steps. Next steps for you when you're thinking about your brand. Hopefully you're taking, hopefully you take some time and look at the slides, particularly the one that showed how you start to craft your positioning statement. And you take some time to think about what do I like? What do I want to highlight? And you're going to take that and put it into your LinkedIn profile. Um, make sure that it's complete. 100%. Um, it needs to look intentional like you've actually put time into it. Identify 10 people that should be in your network that aren't already. You'd be surprised at how many people you work with that you're not connected to. Go ahead and connect with them because then their connections will become your second connections and it will help as you build your brand and you connect with people. Join some groups, either professional associations. If you're not in the Carlson group, please go do that after this. Um, and then I encourage you to reach out to one um, one person in your in your network that you haven't and and either have a quick Zoom call or have a quick coffee, but use it as a time to actually engage and network with someone. Oftentimes, this could be someone you worked with in the past and you haven't worked with in a long time. Get out there and start meeting with people. Um, it makes understanding what your brand is. The more you network, the more you will actually understand what your brand is too and how you thrive. And then finally, remember that over time, we are not static. Even though I talked about Oprah having these strong, consistent words over time, her interests have changed. And what she highlights about her brand has changed. Oprah used to never delve into politics. And then she started to write, things change, people can change. Um, so really notice those changes, particularly if you're a student. 
or if you're coming into the program, you're going to change and evolve a lot in this program. Notice where your energy changes and notice where your shifts or interests change after you become a student or after you graduate. Um, pay attention to that because you might wanna be making some slight adjustments to your personal brand and how you communicate that to others. And I have one last slide for you. This is um, one of my favorite career books these days. It's called Career Story, The Career Stories Method by Carrie Twigg. We have them in our library if you ever want to check it out. But um, in her first couple of pages, she begins um, with this quote that I just think is so beautiful. Careers are one of the most beautiful things you can build in your life. A career is not a job or even a series of jobs. A career is the accumulation of your life experiences and skills. You can judge its success by how you feel in it. It's something you get to build. And if you ignore it, it gets built for you. So don't, don't have someone else build your career. Don't have your crazy overworked sympathetic system build your career. You get to take, take control and build it yourself. Um, and the first one of the first steps is building your personal brand. That's all the slides I have for you. So I'm happy to take any questions in the last couple of minutes. Um, if anyone has any. Yes, we've got lots of alumni in the LinkedIn group. That's for sure, Well, Yeah, thanks, Maggie. This is really inspiring. Lots of practical things that, um, yeah, as a LinkedIn nerd, I will say, uh, <laughs> I just, lots of things I'm thinking about what I should do with my profile. I was actually doing <laughs> a few edits this morning, and now I have a few new ideas. So thanks for those very tactical ideas. Thanks, Will. Oh, this is a good question. And we'll feel free to chime in on this one too. But how does the alumni network really help new students like me? Um, first and foremost, most, um, most alumni love to help students. When you're a student, people love helping you, particularly when you go to the, you go to the same school that they went to. Uh, we often refer students to connect with alumni who are doing um, roles that they think they might be interested in or working for companies they think they might be interested in. So you would reach out to an alum and say, hey, I would love to just connect with you for 20 to 30 minutes, learning a little bit more about what you do or learning a little bit more about company X or a little bit more of how you made the transition from this to this. Um, and that's the that's the typical way that you would utilize LinkedIn for alumni. Um, we introduce alumni a lot to students through um, events and panels and networking events. Um, and then following up after anyone you've met, you'd wanna follow up with that alumni and connect with them on LinkedIn. Well, what did I miss? Oh, excellent, yeah. I mean, specifically for new students, it's a wealth of information, um, but for anyone, the number one way to land a new role, whether it's that MBA level internship or a uh, job, it's gonna be through a connection and so, the alumni network being so robust is just such a wealth of opportunities for referrals, connections. Um, yeah, learning about those jobs. Absolutely. Well, if there are no more questions, um, will we email this out? We also post it on the website, correct? Yes. So we will get the copy of the slide deck and recording once it's downloaded and be able to get it out to everyone who attended today. Well, there are a couple of questions. Should I take a couple of minutes? I think we have a couple more minutes. Okay. Will it ever get difficult to try to live up to the personal brand that you've built up? Um, I think that's such a good question. And I think as you're creating your brand, that's why it's so important to make a brand that's true to you. Right. I think that the people run into like, ah, how am I going to live up to saying I'm an expert in this or saying that I love this or saying when maybe you don't. So I think that's one of the pieces. Authenticity is so important. I also think you're probably being a tad hard on yourself because um, if these if, if, if you've taken the time to write a brand that does highlight your skills and your interests, and that is who you are, you don't have to live up to it. It is who you are. Um, should I use a personal brand or a company brand on my LinkedIn profile? And how can I ensure consistency between my personal brand and the brand of the company I work for or own? Um, that's a great question. I think um, it kind of depends on what your focus is. And so if you want people to know you right now for this company that you own, then that would be in your headline or your tagline. If entrepreneur, uh, food entrepreneur, or tech entrepreneur, whatever, is sort of what you want to be known for and you want to connect with other entrepreneurs, then you would highlight that. I think it really depends on you or the company and what you want to highlight at any given moment. Will, do you agree? 
Definitely. I mean, I think you need to be thinking about owning your career throughout the time that you are, um, you know, working for a, a company, but at the same time, you know, you are a unique individual at your organization. And so as long as the information that you are sharing out there is in direct conflict with your personal brand, I think many of us have seen times when someone has used their social media platforms to further something that they personally believe, but is in such stark contrast with what the company values that it has led to people being let go or or different other fallout issues. So think about what your company has as far as their own social media policies is one thing to be considered of. But if it's your own company and you can't, you know, you can fire yourself or not, you know, think about how your own personal brand may support your company brand. Because a lot of times in solo companies or smaller companies that you own, people connect so well with that individual, that leader. And so the brand that you represent for yourself and in all walks of your life probably also uh, impact and filter into the company that you are leading. Great advice. I will answer this last question really, really quickly, and then I know we have to go. Um, what if you're interested in multiple positions? What do you do with your LinkedIn profile? I think that's when you highlight the skills and the interests and the things that you want to use, rather than thinking about what other people want. At this point, you're just thinking about, at the bare minimum, these are the things that I want to use, and this is what I stand for, and this is how I show up, and kind of disregard whatever is out there that you might want. And then as you hone in on what that key job is, then you can you can make some adjustments. Yeah, so as we wrap up today, thank you so much, Maggie, for sharing your insights with us. I know there are probably a few questions we didn't get to in the transcript. Um, I've dropped my email in the chat. So if you do have any follow-up questions that haven't been addressed so far, or you just want to connect, uh, I've actually, I probably should have put my LinkedIn profile in here because I am such a LinkedIn uh, user, but would just love to continue to stay connected with you, whether you're an alum, a current student, a student that's incoming, we would just love to stay in touch with you so that you know all the resources and continue this conversation about developing your own personal brand. So thank you again for everyone who attended today. And thank you, Maggie, for sharing such a wonderful deck with us. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Will.